Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good, good. Welcome to our financial education event. My name is Paul Zarling. I'm the managing partner here at Clyde First. And we're happy to have you with us for our event. So a couple of housekeeping things before I get started and introduce the speakers. Uh, number one, you should have the printout packet uh, with you so you can take notes. Two is you'll have a feedback form which you'll give us some feedback and hand it in later. Three, there's post-it notes on your table of a variety of colors. Those are meant for you to write questions that you want our experts up here to answer. So feel free to use those. We'll have a team that comes around for those later. <laughs> Bathrooms are all the way in the back. Please silence your phones out of courtesy for uh, other attendees. And uh, this isn't church or school, so if you need like more food or drink, just go ahead and go and get it, right? All right, and for those that know, we like to start these off with a little bit of trivia. So the trivia I have for you today is what, now this is West Bend, according to AccuWeather, what was the temperature in Fahrenheit on Easter Sunday? It wasn't that long ago. Only a couple days. Any guesses? 42, I heard a 45, 48, 39. Okay, in West Bend, it was recorded 43 degrees. Sorry, 37 degrees. Pardon me. I just, I just screwed it up. 37 degrees. Uh, it was recorded like 38, I think, in Milwaukee. Now, other important holiday, Christmas Day, 2021. What was the temperature in West Bend, Wisconsin? 43. <laughs> 43, you got me. She got me right away. Right away she got me. So 43 degrees, right? So it's interesting, right? Warmer in Christmas than it was in Easter, right? Doesn't really fit with the paradigm. And I think the takeaway from that is always take a look at the data so you know what's going on. You're going to see a lot of data here. And there's going to be some paradigms which may be, uh, you know, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Maybe debunked or myth buster. Uh, but uh, we'll let uh, the team of experts talk about it here shortly. So I'm going to introduce the speakers now. I'm very excited to have the full team with us. So David Zarling is here. He is our head of investment strategy and research, but navigating the markets for over 15 years. We also have Ian McMillan. Ian uh, lives in Charlotte, but we're glad he's here. He's, he's up with us very frequently, so we're excited for him. Another teammate, Dan Gorguber, uh, lives in Western Minnesota, North Dakota State grad. Uh, has been uh, in the, involved in the markets for uh, probably, what, five, seven years now? Yeah. And uh, we're just excited that he's on the team. So you can see all three of them. And then you're going to see Kevin Ferrari up on the panel. So full roster today, lots of expertise. And so with that, a round of applause, please, for David Zarling and our full adaptive investment management team. Thank you, Paul. Uh, first of all, how's sound? Good? Too loud? Perfect. Thank you, Diane. I know it's going to be a great presentation when I hear a woohoo when Kevin Ferrari's name is brought up. So I'm really excited. We'll get this through quickly so we can get him up here. Uh, I always really get excited for these. Uh, this is an opportunity to us for sh to share our knowledge, share what we're seeing. There's a lot of information out there. I always have to start with the legalese. So we know our clients, we know their situation, where their fiduciary, we're operating in their business interest. You might be here and you're not a client and that's perfectly okay, that's half the reason why we do these. But don't take this home as some type of investment advice, it's purely for illustration and education purposes only. I'm required to say that, but let's jump into this. Uh, our agenda for today, do we have the ability to adapt to different market environments? Might, might make sense to identify market environments first. We'll talk about that. Ian's going to come up and talk about a popular portfolio approach and walk you through whether that is seeing some trouble or not. We're going to walk through our can we identify any forgotten asset classes. Dan's going to come up and talk about that. And I'm really excited to have Ian and Dan do this along with Kevin. It's one thing to just do this by myself, but it's good to have, give you guys a variety of individuals that come up and share their expertise so you can see what we're bringing to bear for our clients on their behalf. So we'll do that panel discussion and we'll have some housekeeping and final thoughts. I'm overly energetic right now because we just came off of Championship Sunday. 
okay? So you may have read in the Bible about a guy named Paul. He called himself the king of sinners. He only called himself that because he didn't meet me. <laughs> and what's awesome about Easter is we get to celebrate those sins being removed from me. We get to rise again. And I hope you guys enjoyed that celebration too. The way they describe it in the Bible is that sick people need a doctor. That's the way Jesus described it. I also needed a real doctor in literal life currently. He still owes my healer and my doctor. But back in November, I was doing, I like to lift, uh, do resistance training, and I was doing it, what's called an upright row. It's this movement here. And I heard a zing. Like, like I felt the zing, I heard it. Didn't feel great. Wasn't too happy with myself. Didn't try to go down the avenue of, oh, somebody's getting older. Nope. No, no, no. We're not going down that thought process. But I tried to give it some time and rehab, a couple months. Didn't get better. Uh, finally, my wonderful wife, who is here today, she should be given a round of applause for dealing with me. Um, she helped get me to the doctor, get me some appointments, and I just kind of want to walk you through the process because it's a lot like what we do at Client First. It's just involving two different things. One is physical health and one is financial health. And so an appointment's made, uh, we talk to a nurse, I get in, nurse takes my vitals, Next up, physician's assistant comes in, she feels my elbow, she asks me questions. Okay, Mr. Zarling, there's a problem here. Um, we're gonna have the doctor come in. Doctor comes in, they do an ultrasound, which I never knew you could do an ultrasound on an elbow, but you can. Uh, they couldn't really identify what was wrong. Said, you need to have an MRI. Now, the weird part is they said, we also need an x-ray because we gotta prove to insurance, yada, 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 you need an MRI. So get my x-ray, so I met with x-ray techs. They go through the whole rig and roll. That's, that's where you can see. Now this, this is not my actual elbow. This is just one that represents me on the screen today. Um, but they walk through my x-rays. Then we scheduled an MRI. So I met with the MRI techs, the experts, right? Because I don't know how to read an x-ray. I don't know how to read an MRI. I don't know how to do these, do these things. Identified through the MRI, I need something called a 10x procedure. 10x procedures. Uh, a fancy way of describing, they take a needle that rotates at 2,700 seconds per, or 2,700 times per second. Think about that. So if you think that things are getting worse in the world, just think about stuff like that. Okay, like that's amazing. So they go in and they shave down the tendon to regenerate some health going on in the tendon to make it better. But in that process, I don't just walk in and they stick the needle. Meet with the right nurses, meet with the right doctor, physician's assistant again, go through the procedure, have a post-op meeting. My elbow feels amazing, like dangerously. It was four weeks ago. I have to wait two more weeks. I really want to start like flipping tables because I haven't been able to like lift or squeeze anything. So I feel like the need to lift. But it's amazing what they were able to do just by me meeting with some experts and all things that I couldn't do. And the reason why I bring that up is that's a little bit like what we do here at Client First is if you did taxes with us, you met some of our tax experts. You met our, our, our certified financial planning team. You may have dealt with our insurance team. We have licensed insurance people. We have an estate planning attorney that, attorney that works with us. These are all experts in their field. Today we're gonna be talking about the expertise of the adaptive system that fits into our client's financial plan. The way, if this is something you're curious about, you're not a client with us, it's a very simple approach. We've made it pretty simple. You can schedule a no-fee consultation with us, and we're pretty low pressure. I mean, you don't see me up here wearing a tie. I'm wearing tennis shoes, okay? We don't need to win your business. We just need to earn your trust. So if this is something you're interested in, it's pretty simple. Come in, no-fee consultation. You work with our financial planning team. They set up a plan for you. And then as life, cha life changes, they adapt. They help adapt your plan. So for us and the adaptive investment management system, we want to be focused on the signal and avoid the noise. I just want to highlight the current market environment, how we use adaptive, and give you some concrete examples of how we manage risk. Okay, risk management is our priority number one. Right? We don't drive around with our seatbelts off and run through red lights. That's not how we manage money. Okay? So for us, adaptive investment management system spells AIMS. Same thing, you can always remember we're gonna identify risk and reward. 
We're going to invest with the direction of the trend. We're going to manage risk using the weight of evidence. And we're going to stay disciplined to that process with three main objectives. Okay, big wins, small wins, small losses. We are not going to be perfect in asset selection, but we're going to know when we're wrong, which I hope in life you appreciate that because sometimes in other areas of my life, I wish I knew when I was wrong. We have a process where we can identify for investments when we're wrong. So the current market environment. Now, to orientate you to the next blizzard of charts that I'm about to throw at you, a couple things. There's a bunch of different indices that I'm sharing with you. They represent broad market perspective. There's an orange dotted line, or at least it's dotted. Maybe it doesn't look orange based on how it printed out, but it is orange. I want you to notice that that orange line marks February, March of 2021 on every slide. And you will notice that something changed in February, March of 2021. Okay, so we're starting with the NASDAQ 100. These are the largest 100 tech stocks in the United States. Think Apple, think Google, think Microsoft, those type of names. It hasn't gone anywhere for almost a year, 360 days. Okay, NYSE, much bigger composite, way more constituents, more broad. This hasn't gone anywhere for 344 days, barely anywhere since February, March of 2021. Russell 2000, this is a very strong representation of small cap US based companies. Sideways for 482 days. Again, highlighting where February and March of 2021 are. S&P 500, one of the best indices in the world. So when we look at these, like if you review these, like you should be at your nightstand looking through this because you're really excited about it. Okay, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, when you do that, you'll notice that the two best are the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100. Look through everything else and it's trash. It's been trash for over 360 days. Dow Jones, 343 days sideways. Total world index, so this is like, I believe it's close to 7,000 constituents. Does a really job at representing all the stocks across the globe. Nowhere for 482 days. Again, February, March uh, 2021 highlighted. Emerging markets, this one's a little more fun. I thought about not putting the years on here and making you calculate it, but I put the years on there. That's 15 years of nothing but heartburn. And the industry tells you you should own emerging markets. Really, we disagree. Europe, again, 16 years, okay? There are many things, I wanna visit Europe. I've never been there. I want to visit it because I've heard the food and beer and locations and everything is just amazing. I don't know if I want their economy. I don't know if I want their equity markets because you can retire in that 16 year window, right? You could retire when you're 62 and have 16 years of something like that. Could happen to the US. Here's uh, Europe plus the Far East, 5,635 days of nothing. Again, they told you you should own it no matter what. You should buy and hold this. Japan, talk about the poster child for why you don't buy and hold investments. 26 years. 26 years, that's, I don't even know. Emily, do we know each other? That's a long time. And if you don't think, Ian's gonna come up here and talk about a, a, a subject that many don't want to talk about as far as what's going on in our bond market. If you don't think this is possible, there's a country that already did to their bond market, which we might be doing to ours, and so U.S. stocks could look like this. So what's your process? What's your process for handling this type of environment? China, 15 plus years, jack squat, move sideways. 20 year treasuries, interestingly enough, kind of talking about bonds, 13 years of nowhere. Now at least people got yield out of that. Maybe there's some yield that paid on that. Aggregate bonds, 18 years. 
Now, the, the treasuries and bonds, a lot of this is because of the recent correction that's happened in bonds. So when we look at corrections, they really have two characteristics. They either happen through time, so they take a long time, or they happen through price. So like the, the COVID panic crash was 26 days, minus 35%. That's a correction through price. The fastest correction, in fact, of the history of markets that we've been able to track. Now you look at some of these other charts, and they're correcting through time. So when people say to me, oh, do you think the market's about to fall apart? I might ask them, where have you been for the past year? Because the market's been doing nothing but moving sideways and underneath the surface selling off. The correction is already upon us. It's been happening. It's just the S&P 500 and NASDAQ are so nice to put on the TV screen. They fit really good with the red and green on CNBC, and so that's what people pay attention to. Total world index, jumping back to this. That's that example of, that's a correction through time. Now, the caveat is, is this a correction through time that resolves higher, or is it one that resolves lower? And the good news is, I can tell you I don't know. <laughs> so I better have a process for identifying directionally which way this is gonna go, and we do that with adaptive by identifying levels for example, you'll notice that this recently touched some important levels that actually go back to 428 days. If it's below that, the evidence continues to build that this is something way bigger than just a sideways correction. But we're also open-minded knowing that if this resolves higher, we are more than happy to get more aggressive in client portfolios and participate in that. So to drive home the concept of the correction we've seen, okay, so you, I, I need now you to understand, we have been in a bear market. For example, if we look at the NASDAQ composite, so this is no longer the NASDAQ 100, this is a much big, bigger representation of Na, like NASDAQ stocks. Nearly 40% of NASDAQ stocks are 50% or more below their high. So by very definition, that's a correction. Because the media likes to tell us that, and I don't know why they picked this number, but minus 20% is a bear market. So 50 or 40% of the NASDAQ is beyond a bear market. Only 12% are 50% or more above their 50, 52 week lows. So it's been very weak, and again, I put the line on there for you. So we've been in a correction, we've been in a bear market since February, March of 2021. This table helps highlight looking back one year and then looking back year to date. So the top portion is year to date. On the left are the different indices. So like the NYSE, the NASDAQ, the S&P 500. And you can just work yourself across and see the median member of something like the NASDAQ 100 year to date is down 12.5% year to date. That's just this year. The NASDAQ median member in the past 52 weeks, so the average member of that index is down 37%. Is that a bull market? No. That's a correction. Same thing, S&P 500. You can look through this whole thing and you can see all these drawdowns that have taken place over the past year plus one month-ish. So again, this, either, this resolves in one of two ways. Either all the weakness that's ha happened underneath the surface starts to solidify and the race restarts and the runners can start running again and we can start and the market broadens out, or the things that have held up last catch down to everything else. And the things that have held up last are the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100. You could argue the Dow Jones as well. So identifying again corrections through time and price, previous things that had done very, very well. because. A whole bunch of people in the industry were tilted towards growth, growth type names. One of the poster childs for that is ARK Innovation. It's a nice ETF, but it's very focused on growth companies. Again, I've highlighted February and March of 2021. We have corrected 62% in that particular vehicle. These are IPOs, initial public offerings. 
This, these are when companies come to market and raise capital through offering stock, which people can buy to help them run their business. And you can look at one or two ways. I've, there were a lot of IPOs in the late 90s too. Since February, March of 2021, we've corrected minus 46%. Software, very similar to that ARC innovation. Uh, everything has seemed to tilt towards software. Not so much for the past 13 months, minus 42%. <clears throat> Cannabis, controversial, I get it, but it's a business out there that used to draw a lot of attention and had a lot of investors with it, minus 71%. <clears throat> Keep in mind that's happening under an administration that was supposed to be friendly to it. Just throwing it out there. <clears throat> International. Okay, we're looking at all the world stocks. I think this one excludes the U.S., so this is international stocks, subtracts out U.S. stocks. Minus 13%. Emerging markets, which again you're supposed to have been holding in your portfolio. We have not owned any with the exception of we own Brazil for a little bit, minus 24%. Aggregate bonds, again, supposed to be a safe haven, so think about this, and what Ian's gonna be coming up very shortly to highlight this. Stocks down, bonds down. Huh, that's not supposed to happen. Minus 14% for aggregate bonds. So, in our process, we're not gonna hold on to software because it's cool. We're not gonna invest in cannabis because it's the latest thing. We're not gonna buy international stocks because that's what the industry says you have to hold in your portfolio. Why would we do that when we have the data? So I wanted to walk you through some of our best sales in the first quarter. Anybody can hit the buy button, but can you hit the sell button when the risk is too much? We do not wanna to sink to the bottom. Okay, these are the losses that happen. Okay, we talked about cannabis is down 70%. That's gonna take 233% return to get back to even. So if you own cannabis, I'm sorry. And it's likely that that's gonna take like a decade to get back. Maybe not, I have no idea. But the reason why we are in the risk management business my priority number one of what we do at the adaptive system is because the further we go this way, the longer, right, price and time corrects, the same applies to coming back. It's always down the elevator, up the escalator. And when you're near and near retirement, that gets a little bit hard to go through if you're starting to take withdrawals. 20s and 30s, that's fine. But as you get near, closer to retirement, to go through scenarios where your account potentially could be cut in half. You're talking about your retirement income being cut in half. It's a little bit problematic. So, some sales. So again, when we enter a room, so when we enter a trade, so let's imagine I'm going to a concert, and there's this big crowd there. I don't even know who I'm seeing. Let's say it's king and country or something like that. It's crowded. I probably should identify where the exit is, right? Because I don't know what's gonna happen at this crowded place. So I need to have a plan. Not that I'm expecting a ride or anything at King and Country. It seems like it would be a pretty good, safe place. But I also think semiconductors can be a pretty safe place. Enter on this date, exit on this date. One, two, three, four, five, six days. We lost 6% on that trade. Hey, that doesn't mean 6% on the whole portfolio. It just means on that slice within the portfolio. But avoided minus 27%, okay, small loss, avoid the big loss. Technology, same concept, enter because the evidence showed we could enter, but we also exit. We gained about 0.7% on this. After the exit, that particular thing is down minus 13%. Global shipping, which is an interesting one from a uh, standpoint of when we look globally that we've been in this corrective phase that shipping is actually kind of and it's actually kind of returning so we entered exited with a profit 10 percent after exiting it dropped six and we've actually just re-entered that trade okay carbon credits 
credits. This is an interesting one. Just from the, what is a carbon credit? These are what people are buying. Have you ever heard of ESG? Environmental, social, and governance. This is an investment style where they are looking to identify who is on your board. And whoever's on your board, they better be really diversified. Meaning, person of color, or certain sexual orientation. And that's fine if that's the way they want to invest. Mm -hmm. Or it might be how they conduct business. Like, in my mind, a, a natural one would be if, if you're an energy company in Saskatchewan, Canada, and you're strip mining the oil sands, probably looked upon poorly within the ESG community as far as whether that's good or bad. My point with this being, companies buy these things to offset their score if they have a negative ESG score. It's weird, I kind of went down a dovetail there, but we can participate in when they're going, we can participate in them when they're going lower left to upper right. So we did, had a gain. After we exited, there was, it dropped 9%. We were able to avoid that, even being considered for re-entry. We're not buying them because we're ESG. We're not buying because we think we need to offset our carbon footprint. Global foundries entered it three days later out of it. So we lost 11% on that, but avoided minus 22. Fair trade. This is short internet. So shorting can happen in two of our models, or I should, excuse me, three of our models. So we have four models that we operate, balanced, moderate growth, and ultra growth. In those three top models, we can take positions. So when things are moving down, so the, all those things that I was talking about that were moving down, we can buy positions in something that actually go up in value when those go down. Okay, so we can make gains off of that. So we were short internet in the first quarter, right at the start, able to gain 46% on that position. After we exited, it's down 12. Uh, that was short SPACs. SPACs are these uh, special acquisition vehicles. It allows people to raise funds without actually having to file an IPO. It's very unique. Uh, I would say it's a sign of the times, the search for credit uh, as credit gets more expensive. Able to participate in shorting that as it's falling. We're shorting it, making money. Percentage gain, 29%. After we exit, minus 6%. So as you notice, not all of those were perfect. Some of those had losses, and that's okay, because we don't want to participate in the bigger loss. So that's just highlighting some of our, our differences. And now I'm going to have Ian McMillan walk up. Ian, uh, as Paul mentioned, is from Charlotte, uh, has a beautiful wife and child. Uh, this is Financial Literacy Month. Ian actually wrote a book called What is a Stock? He wrote it for kids. If you ever want to check that out, you can Google that, look for that online. But he is here to talk to you about a very important topic. Uh, so please, round, warm round of applause for Ian. Thank you, sir. Sound is good? Yeah. Good. Glad to see you all again. Uh, I'm not going to lie, on my Easter, I played in my backyard barefoot, <laughs> then woke up to two inches of snow on Monday morning. But that is okay, I love being here, and really excited about what we're going to talk about today, the 60-40 portfolio. Uh, before I get started, um, is anyone here, or are we kind of aware of this like concept, have you ever heard? Um, the media talk about it, or um, any of your friends and family. Um, if not, it is a very broadly used, I'll call it a thesis, in the wealth management RIA um, portfolio <laughs> construction space. And we're not going to hate on it too much. We actually have a model. The uh, moderate model is technically benchmarked to this, so 60-40 portfolio, uh, broadly means 60% equities, 40% fixed income. And this for years, decades at this point, has been seen as an appropriate kind of balance for people entering retirement. You're gonna get the 
uptick from equities, kind of the bigger gains from, there, from those. And then the fixed income is going to give you some cash flow back when we asked you to get cash flow off of bonds. Um, and most likely going to, or in theory, kind of dampen that volatility when stocks go through a large correction. It is seen kind of another textbook theory um, that investors will rush to risk off assets, risk off assets such as bonds. You'll see those rise and it kind of, again, help, it helps dampen uh, the overall drawdown of the portfolio. So like I said, I mean, this has been around it's been a very strong concept, certainly since I would say the early 2000s. Um, really, it's worked for, for four decades because the big part, that 40% part, the fixed income part, has had a major, major tailwind behind it of falling rates. We already kind of talked about it. And then the last piece I'm going to go over today is kind of the quantification. Just how simple that the industry felt that this had become, that it was always going to play out the way it should, and how earlier this year, or so far this year, what we have seen, um, that that has really kind of been blown up. So the 60-40 portfolio, as you can see, over the last decade, pretty solid returns. Not a lot to complain about. Why would you touch it? If it's worked for 10 years, why would that change? Not so great during the what they call the lost decade. You could actually argue that uh, markets didn't go anywhere till 2013. It's a little bit more than a decade. Um, again, not a great decade, but has certainly resurfaced over the last 10 years as a kind of this undeniable, why wouldn't you do this? This is super easy. Um, and it's kind of that uh, get it and forget it type attitude. Now, we look at what a strategy like this would do in an environment such as the 70s, a much more inflationary environment where you've got a lot of things working against you. So as you can see, 1970, we're starting out with, let's say you have 100 bucks. By the time you get to 75, that 100 bucks is now worth about 65. Based on inflation, that headwind that right we're seeing a lot right now in the real world, that's worth about 40, 40 bucks. So in five years, you lost roughly 60% of your capital in real dollar terms. Um, based on this idea that these two assets together um, are some great combination of growth and lower volatility. And, and this is true for a lot of times throughout history, this has been true. Here's a correlation to the S the, between the S&P 500 and the US Aggregate Bond Index, which is uh, essentially just uh, an index that averages, averages together all types of bonds in the U.S. Corporate bonds, mortgage bonds, high yield bonds, um, so forth. And as you can see, we've entered this period over the last couple of years where there is a very tight positive correlation, similar to what we saw in 2010, um, well really going into um, going into the, doc, or the great financial crisis and coming out. So, the theory behind this is they should, they're supposed to remain uncorrelated. You want one going up while the other is going down, or at least going slightly down, um, and that's what offsets. Again, unfortunately, 2022 um, has been a pretty rude awakening to this theory. So, we're going to start off on the 60 side, stocks, Dave covered this pretty well. Uh, stocks, most stocks haven't gone anywhere for a long, long time. An even rougher start in 2022. We've got our major indices, the Dow, the S&P, small caps, and the NASDAQ, all down this year. So in theory, this 40% should be kicking in, right? My fixed income, we should see investors rushing to, if they're scared to be in equities, then they probably want to move towards something like fixed income where their money's a little safer. 
everything outside of energy and a little bit of utilities and staples, again, negative this year. Very, very uh, few places to hide. And that's why you see the major indices flat because energy is about 4% of the S&P. Your big guys down here, tech, um, discretionary, communication services, financials, industrials, all these important sectors with larger weightings are negative. But energy, hey, great first start to the year. So if you've been there, it's been awesome. And commodities as well, but I'm gonna let Dan touch on that in a few minutes. So again, we see this Vanguard total stock market here in blue, down, down, down. Total bond market, down, down, down. That's not supposed to be happening. And in fact, this year, coming off the 2020 highs in bonds, long-term treasuries have hit their largest drawdown ever, worse than the great financial crisis. So it is a little odd to me that we've gotten to 2022 and there has been this panic over fixed income when bonds have actually been going down for years. If you're in one of our models that has the potential to be allocated towards fixed income, you will notice you have not owned fixed income or at least an overweight in any type of fixed income for very, I mean, months at this point. I think there, we might have added a little bit of junk bonds recently for a small trade, but it was a minimal... Um, position. In fact, we've shorted bonds a lot over the last few months. So this isn't a, to us, having the potential to allocate to 40% fixed income doesn't constantly mean that it's got to be there. If bonds are in a drawdown and losing our clients money, why would we be there for the sake of some type of textbook theory about how this is supposed to lower the volatility of your portfolio? It hasn't done that. Maybe it will, you know, in the future, maybe, you know, in the coming weeks, we'll see stocks fall off and bonds rise. And at that time, we will choose to participate, but that has not yet been the case. So let's talk about rates. As we know, again, going back to uh, 2020 is when rates bottomed. We've seen them, and thus when bonds peaked. Uh, and we've seen them move higher. So this is going back to that peak that we saw in the early 80s. This has been that tailwind that I talked about for the 40% of this portfolio of rates down, bond prices up. It has worked like a magic charm and no one has batted an eye. Is that about to change? The answer is I don't know. I will tell you if the 10-year gets above this, this is about 3%, uh, the chances will increase that this continues higher and now we may potentially be on a uh, new multi-year, maybe even multi-decade decade uptrend in rates. Again, we're right now we're coming back to a trend line here. So while this has been a huge move, this 40 plus year trend technically has not been violated. As painful as this has been, we are coming back to um, what would you call the historic trend? The same, here's longer term rates. So we had the late 70s push. Since then, again, coming back into this trend line. Will it break through? I have yet to see that. Uh, you know, we haven't seen that yet. The momentum would say, yes, I mean, rates haven't rolled over. They don't seem like they're going to. It's not, I don't think that our government has applied. They have an interest in trying to dampen this. If the 30-year treasury rate gets above its 2018 highs around 3.2, 3.4%, that will signal that, yes, we are most likely moving into a continued multi-year, multi-decade move in rates. Now, will it move at this same rate? Again, I have no idea. I'm, I am willing to bet that it will be a much sloppier rise should this take than it was a downturn. Just over the last 30 days, treasuries 
the bastion of safety in American investing, right? Down 11% in the last month. This is a 4 point, or I'm sorry, 3.8 standard deviation move. I'm not going to get into that. But you should see this roughly happen about every 500 years. Well, it happened. And there was the clues. Like I said, bonds had been going down for two years at this point. There was really no reason to be involved in that. Here's again the TLT, long-term bonds, worst drawdown in history um, off this high, and a very, very painful last um, <clears throat> few months. With that said, right, I know you're all asking, okay, Ian, if I can't own stocks, I can't own bonds, what am I going to do with my money? Well, uh, we're going to talk about commodities a little bit, um, a, an asset that's getting a little bit more attention in the media. I'm still going to say most investors and advisors there are probably still grossly underallocated commodities, um, even with the runs we've had over the last few months. Um, but I'm not going to talk to you about that. I'm going to let the commodity expert himself, Dan Gore Cooper, come up and inform you and educate you, Thank you. on what we have been seeing. All right, while Dan, while Dan is getting set up, um, some of you have note cards or sticky notes at your table that you were supposed to put questions on for the sake of uh, expediency. So believe it or not, the adaptive team, our main priority is not giving presentations. It's managing money. So after this, we're going to be going directly to the office. We're going to have our Q&A. But if you have questions, the team is walking around. If you could hand that sticky note to them, uh, preferably with your name on it. If you have questions, put your name on it, because then that at least gives me an opportunity, if we don't answer here, to send you an email with the answer so that you're not feeling ignored. Okay, so there's Brad's walking around. Uh, I think I see Morgan and Chris coming up. Uh, just hold them in the air. They're nice and bright. If you have questions, again, put your name on it. That would be great. Dan, thanks for coming and talking commodities. All right. Can everybody hear me all right? First time on the mic, so i got to kind of test it out, feel it out. Just as a reminder, too, as you're going around uh, or filling out the sticky notes, we do have food in the back still. So I know sitting for a while, uh, I always like to get up, rest the legs, uh, get them moving again. So if you do want some food or some drinks, uh, head on back there. Again, thank you, Ian and Dave, uh, for, for setting this up for me and allowing me to uh, kind of take the, I would say, uh, greener approach or maybe even more uptrending approach here with this current market environment and that would be commodities right how many of us um, really over the last couple of years uh, and, and really more recently uh, have been kind of been paying attention to this commodity realm uh, overall could be talked about we, we do live in the Midwest right so out our backyard we do have a lot of you know corn fields bean fields uh, maybe some uh, pastures for cattle etc but it really does not get the exposure and, and more recently again the uh, the headline news that it, that it probably should get uh, for what's going on so we're gonna we're gonna dive into that I'm gonna give some perspective kind of the first point I want to talk about uh, the next point that I really want to get to is just kind of decide or, or running through this what's called the CRB index okay uh, some of you may be familiar with that I've, I believe we've talked about it in, the, in some of our past presentations, or uh, if you're a listener on the podcast. And then I also want to run through some of our adaptive personal levels that we're looking at for a couple different products in some of our uh, you know, bigger, higher level uh, type crude oils, um, and then also some eggs as well. And then kind of finish it up with uh, more of a currency structure play uh, with the US dollar, right? Um, Currencies and commodities tend to, when they're talked about, when one, when one is talked about, usually the other one is talked about as well. They kind of go hand in hand uh, from that perspective. So I have about oh, a couple, at least 10, 15 minutes here uh, before our Q&A, so I'll try to run through this stuff here uh, as we go. All right, so the perspective slide here. 
as you can see on your slide, or on your, in your slide deck on the graph, this is a three-year performance chart of all the major commodity contracts. Now, these are going to be quoting futures. Um, but you'll see every single one of them over the past three years, and I started with three years because I wanted to get some of the, some of the data before 2020, right? Uh, so it's going to capture basically one year before the 2020 uh, crash, right? You can look at some of these numbers. Wheat up over 150%. Uh, corn up 125% in that egg sector. Natural gas, big one, big input for a lot of us, right, to heat our homes, uh, up over 180%, okay? Baltic Dry Index, CRB Index, all very, very much in the green. And kind of the theme here is, number one, these returns, um, we don't know if they're gonna continue, right? We don't, we don't have a magic eight ball or a, or a uh, look into the future to know exactly what's gonna happen. But there is, as I go through these slides, this has been a theme now for, I would say at least two years, okay? This is not something new. Uh, and just looking at some of these, some of these numbers kind of starts to portray that, right? So now let's take a look at some of our, like household product names that you might have as inputs or that you might see on the store shelves uh, in your backyard, etc. For more of like a uh, one year, I believe I had, excuse me, year to date performance perspective. Okay, so I went from three years on the previous slide to now year to date to kind of give some flavor for more short term versus intermediate to long term performance data, right? Natural gas, just year to date, as of when I, when I uh, grabbed this chart yesterday, up over 90% year to date, okay? Next one below that would be gasoline, uh, excuse me, uh, coal, sorry. Coal, just under that, up about almost that 90% mark as well, okay? Sugar, up four and a half percent, we have that in our cupboards. Um, so still up, but not as much, of course, as, as some, of the, some of the energy products. Uh, gasoline, right, that's another big one. Almost 50% year to date to the top side, okay? So these are big numbers that we're throwing out here. And these numbers tend to happen when there's money movement into commodity products like this, right? So now the question to you guys is, I want you to look at the slide deck, right? And if somebody, this is a question I want to ask. Can somebody find me the commodity allocation this is an S&P 500, the most widely followed index breakdown from a sector specific standpoint, right? Goes from technology at the top, all the way down to materials with the weightings on the right hand side. Can somebody find me the commodity allocation in this index? I have the answer for you. It's not there. <laughs> okay? <laughs> It is not there. Directly. Indirectly, yes, we have energy right at 4.23% of the index. Okay, so we're going to get some of that direct exposure and indirect through uh, some of the companies, right, in the S&P 500. But your, your broad indice, one of the most broad, widely followed indices in the S&P 500, the one that everyone talks about and the one that, as we like to say on the team, is undefeated, and, and rightly so, has very, very... If, basically zero commodity exposure at the end of the day when we start to look at this. So that's what I want you to kind of think about as we go through these next slides and kind of how we want to be portraying it to you guys as saying, hey, what we like to do at Adaptive is we want to be able to go into these spaces, right, and, and provide you that direct exposure through some of the market products through ETFs, okay? So, so keep thinking through that as, I, as I'm rolling through. This next slide, CRB Commodity Index, uh, Commodity Research Bureau, Bureau excuse me, uh, is, is that acronym or what, what, what this stands for. And really my point on this slide, again, just shows, number one, in the short term, in 2020, the lows of 2020 after COVID, we've basically seen a straight line shot to the top side, up and to the right, in this Commodity Index. Now this Commodity Index, 
is, an, is a basket of 19 futures. Okay, it's an average of 19 futures. It's heavily weighted in agriculture. Okay, so right out our backyard agriculture. And then also energy products with also precious metals and industrial metal, metals that, that fall in line under 10% of the, of the weight. But again, the majority of this is eggs and energies. You can see in the short term, 2020, 2021, into 2022, this has been, again, straight up and to the right. It's, it's been a theme that's been going on. It's been more highlighted uh, from our perspective probably over the last six months. But this has been going on for, for a couple of years now. Okay. Now I blow this out to the lifetime chart of the CRV index. All the way back to the 1950s, the mid-1950s, for as much as my data allows me to, to go back to. We're basically coming into some of the upper levels of historical prices on this index, okay? Which is an environmental thing we want to be aware of, okay? We've seen this huge surge in commodities recently, right? I mean, take a look at this thing. Over 200% basically from the lows and, and somewhat, you know, we'd argue that this consolidation back in uh, the 50s and 60s, we get a breakout, and now we're just retesting this, or we just retested this in, uh, in 2020, okay? And now we're seeing that, that retest see incredible, incredible demand into the commodities, which, which provides us a surge. Now, if we, if we put this against the CRB index against an SP 500, okay? So I just got done talking about the breakdown of the S&P 500 index and the, and the sector weightings and how there's very minimal, if, if basically zero commodity exposure. Let's put these two together against each other, the CRB index against S&P 500, okay? Look at how, look at how much further we have to go to really, to really start to see a, a broad shift from a relative standpoint, okay? in the CRB index versus the S&P 500. There's been really two other times in history where we've seen some just incredible like five plus year to 10 plus year outperformance of commodities over a broad S&P 500 product. One of those times would be the early to mid 70s, right? That was a, that was a huge time frame for the commodity industry. Uh, I believe back then soybeans Soybeans returned something like 300% over a couple year period. Um, another time frame that, that stands out to us is just as we turned into the 2000s, right? 2000s through 2008 time frame, we saw that outperformance, for, again, broadly speaking, of commodities uh, over the S&P 500. So now here we sit, two, uh, excuse me, 2020, 2021, 2022, where we're starting to see that surge again, right? From a long-term perspective of relative strength where commodities are starting to bring uh, some of that outperformance relative to the broad market, okay? The biggest thing I want you to take away from this is that we don't know where this ratio is gonna go. It's actually in a you know, pretty aggressive downtrend when you look at it from a long-term perspective, but do we have enough to where this initial, initial surge can kind of start to change the thinking? And, and where really it makes us think, and, and to you guys to think, we need to have a potential active slice of this pie and of this, of this puzzle piece of, of commodities. We don't need to have it as a buy and hold approach, right? We want to have it as an active piece that we can come in and out of uh, if, if this trend does want to uh, really turn for us. Another interesting ratio, I'm just going to check my time just to make sure I'm still rolling. Another interesting ratio that, that we like to look at is this, again, CRB index versus long-term treasuries. So in this chart, you'll see the CRB versus TLT. TLT is, again, that long-term treasury ETF. This, we kind of like to measure uh, more, of like, more of an inflationary type of perspective. Um, again, it's all, where is money going? Think of where are dollars going? If this chart is going up and to the right, dollars are going into that commodity index versus something like TLT, again, on a relative perspective, right? 
if money is flowing into TLT or, or long-term treasuries versus the CRV index, we'd, we'd see more of a down, uh, excuse me, down into the, uh, down into the right. But we're not seeing that. We're coming into some, some decent inflection point levels right now, but overall we're seeing a very nice surge off the lows. And we're seeing that, that money continue flowing into that commodity sector over something like treasuries. Okay. This inflection point that I highlight here with the arrow and the line right around this 282, uh, 2825 to 283 level. Keep an eye on that level if you're watching at home. We'll be watching at 42, so don't worry. Uh, but keep an eye on that. It's a big inflection point for us. It's a lot of information at that horizontal price level. Okay. For above that, things could get pretty interesting for commodities to the top side, right? Potentially, again, relative to uh, treasuries. If we're below that, are we consolidating? Some of those questions we'll start to ask. Another quick thing I wanted to run through is just more of a sentiment check. Okay, we're going to take the opposite side approach now. Uh, take some of our biases out of this. Google Trends allows us to run some of this sentiment check for us. Um, we are seeing some pretty aggressive short term and as well as long term. This this data goes back to 2004, so we don't have the most most data out there of it, uh, but some some decent data, right? Um, we have seen in the United States just this, the search for Google. So if you go to Google and you search commodity prices, right? We have seen a pretty big uptick in that re more recently here as we've gone into this year. March was actually a sentiment value of 75. It, it ranks in the top 10 and really the top five, again, in, in the history of this uh, Google Trends data that we have. So something to kind of keep a, an eye on for us and, and for you guys here in the, in the more near term, right, that we want to uh, be watching for. Crude oil futures, all of us, um, no matter what you're talking about, there's crude oil and the demand supply structure of crude oil affects mm -hmm. each, and one, each and every one of our lives in ways we don't even know it. This is a closing price chart, line chart, uh, from a monthly perspective, I believe. Uh, no, excuse me, weekly, um, of crude oil futures, okay? We're coming into some pretty important levels around this 115, again, on a closing price level uh, perspective, 115 level. We want to see this thing really stick in. If, we, if we're looking at this more recent structure here from like 115, and I would even argue all the way down to about this $80 level. Believe it or not, we could consolidate in that range. I know that's a big range, but we could consolidate in that range. And we could still be in a pretty healthy, very healthy crude oil uh, and energy market there. So some key levels, some adaptive levels that we want to be outlining there for you as well. All right. Dan, I might have to cut you short. Okay. The Q &A. Sounds good. We're going to get to the Q&A here. Yep. All right. I'm going to steal your mic. You bet. So round of, round of applause for Dan, because it's, it's not his fault that I talked too long. There we go. And you guys should have a mic over there. Yeah. Here's another question. On another there. question, excellent. Nice. Okay, uh, for the sake of time, well, you've got more too. Wait a minute. Is this like late entry homework? Okay. All right, so what we're going to do since we're up against and I want to respect your time, is we're going to do a question for each of them. And I'm going to give you guys the clicker. Kevin, I'm going to have you go first. Um, right, because that's who they came to see. Kevin Ferrari. So we're talking about. Um, so the, the chart I want to talk about a little bit is I believe there's a commodity versus the dollar chart or dollar versus commodity chart. Yes, this one. So this is commodities versus the weighted dollar index. First of all, can you outline what each of these are? So commodities, what you're using, and what in the world is a weighted dollar index? And then what does this chart, what information is it providing us? Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is like a hazing thing. If you don't turn the mic on. Wow, what a rookie. 
Um, so basically what this chart is showing here for the commodities we're using, DBC, which is just um, essentially a broad basket ETF, um, basically just an overall representation for commodities in general, and then DXY, which is what we're using for the US dollar in this case. Um, I guess the best way to put that would be it's like a trade weighted basket um, for the dollar versus other major currencies. Um, there's specific kind of breakdowns on percentages in there, but we don't really need to worry about that. Um, but as I'm sure you all know by now, we really like to look at relationships here, kind of relative strength. Um, and what's interesting about this relationship, if you think of it, um, I guess if you go back to like economics class in high school, basically what they tell you here, um, strong dollar, obviously bad for commodities, or I shouldn't say obviously, but bad for commodities in general. Um, you figure strong dollar makes it harder for other countries to buy commodities priced in U.S. dollars. Um, so you think there's an inverse relationship there, which kind of as you look at three distinct periods on this chart, um, all the way to the left is roughly the fall of like 2007. Um, you can kind of see this relationship here, commodities are increasing in relation to the dollar. Um, if you look at them separately, actually here, commodities are rising in price as the dollar is falling, so that makes sense. Um, if you look just past that, actually, to the fall of 2010, um, which is a little harder to see there, um, a little bit of Japanese at the beginning, but you can still see kind of a clear trend there as well. Um, kind of the same thing there, commodities rising, dollar falling. Where this gets really interesting is actually more recently, if you go all the way to the right of the chart there, um, you can kind of see this relationship moving up again. But what's interesting, um, there's that consolidation area there with just underneath that orange line. Um, from the very bottom of that trend where it starts, you have kind of the same dynamic in the relationship um, where the dollar's falling, commodities rising. But actually, as that breaks out and continues to move higher, we're actually seeing both of those um, classes kind of move up in unison. So basically, the dollar's been rising, commodity prices have been rising, just commodities are outpacing the dollar. Um, so it's just kind of an interesting dynamic that I guess, if you looked in the textbooks, wouldn't, I guess, generally exist. Um, and just the fact, too, if you think about fall of 2007, fall of 2010, kind of, I guess, what you consider debt, um, yeah. major debt, debt events across debt the, events, yep. yeah, the world. So um, I guess just something interesting, you're kind of seeing it get to an area where you would expect resistance. And if you look at them individually in a whole too, um, they're kind of reaching that point. So just kind of a major, I guess, point of intersection that we're getting to. It's just going to be interesting to see how it plays out from here. Awesome job. So Kevin Ferrari's our hidden gem. He needs to be up here more because what he just basically highlight, highlighted for you is that commodities and the dollar are rising together at a very pivotal point. That's not what you learn. You typically learn that the dollar is depreciating while commodities are moving higher. Now, this, it's a trade-weighted dollar. Yes, there's other currencies. It's weak versus, um, but Kevin's also our, our sharpshooter. He handles our trades during the day, does a great job. So thank you, Kevin, for that. Uh, we only have one question uh, left for each. Uh, I'll have Dan go, and then I'm going to come off the top rope for Ian at the end. Dan, um, you get to pick a favorite chart out of these and or explain what the weekly trend is and why people should listen to it. Okay. That's a trick question. No, no. Well, the, the weekly trend, I mean... Um, what, what is the weekly trend? The weekly trend is our podcast, and, and really, you know, I'm new here, <laughs> so... Um, Ian and Dave started this podcast just over two years ago, was mm -hmm. it? Yeah, this was um, a way we could communicate with our clients plus yes. show our expertise out in the marketplace. So it's a great, easy, uh, efficient way for us to talk markets. Um, actually, like we're sitting around uh, maybe at the bar just talking markets, talking shop with the guys, and that we can portray it to you guys uh, and you can get information very easily on a weekly basis. Uh, it comes out... We, we run it on Fridays normally, and it comes out ready to you on, on uh, many different podcast platforms Saturday morning, again, generally speaking. So yeah. 
Um, I appreciate that. I know it's kind of a fluff question, but the reason why I'm bringing it up is imagine this amount of information provided to you weekly. So you might want to take advantage of that. So you can find it on, online, the weekly trend. You can consume it if you want or not. It, it doesn't matter to us. But I know that some of you here have provided us feedback that you really like it. You can listen to it. You don't have to. The other way to operate is we're the pilots up there. You trust us. It's fine. And I, I also heard Brad. Uh, Brad, if you need help finding the podcast, Brad uh, nominated himself to, to help out with that. So appreciate it. Thank you, Brad. Awesome. All right. So there were a lot of good questions, but again, we are over time. Uh, but I am going to pick one from here, but the rest, what I'm going to try to do, if your name was on here, we're going to try to respond via email. If it wasn't, we're going to try to put a document together and then send that out with answers. But one that's really fascinating in here is basically what do you think about the World Economic Forum and its plans? So Ian, right, I, I figured out. Of all the questions to uh, give me, okay. Yeah, so basically what is the World Economic Forum? I don't know if you can talk about their plans, but maybe you could talk about any concerns you have, positive or negative, about the World Economic Forum. Uh, so, is this on? Is this on? Yeah. yeah. So, World Economic Forum um, is an organization founded by a gentleman named Klaus Schwab. It's been around for um, a few decades now. They've been very instrumental in getting certain people, like lots of certain people, elected into very important positions in government all across the world. Um, and I think over the past couple of years, we've started to see that ultimate plan over there of theirs take place. Uh, I don't know what this means for the stock market. I don't know what it means for bonds. I don't know what it means for other assets. Now, is if, if what we've seen over the last year or two years, um, is that investors moving out of assets that feel could be um, just not worth being involved in. Should some of these policies come into place globally, that could very be true. Do people not want to own U.S. debt anymore? That would be pretty shocking. I mean, as I said, that's kind of been one of the biggest safe havens in investing for I mean, a century, I don't know, a century, more than a century? Right. I mean, it's U.S. debt. Like, we've always been good for it. No one ever questioned that. And now you have seen people running um, for the doors. They can't get out of it fast enough. So what, like, what does that mean? Uh, is it really, right? Because this isn't 2007, 2008 in regards to recessionary issues or, um, you know, unemployment. So why? Would they not want to own bonds? Um, so we'll see. I don't. It's it's a very. Um, I, mean, I don't want to go off on a tangent, <laughs> but uh, what I, what I would suggest you do if you've never heard of the World Economic Forum is go there, and I believe it's called their Young Leaders Program. Yeah, that was kind of what I was referring to in regards to getting these people. Uh, Trudeau was a part of it. The lady in New Zealand was a part of it. Macron was a part of it. Yeah. Tons of people in Washington in their 30s and 40s were brought up through this program. Um, and so, they all answered a, a very, very small... So it, get, it gets weird to talk about some of these things because it comes across as very like conspiracy theory type weirdness. Um, but the information is publicly available. So you can go look it up. You can see who's part of it. It is not run by any certain government. It is a certain group of individuals, and they seem to be in different uh, uh, positions of power, and that has ramifications. So with that... I will say, I will say this. Uh, what I believe has been happening in regards to interest rates, oil, all of that, uh, I don't think that it, this is free markets that oil is at $115, $120 a barrel. I will tell you that. Right. And so when you think about that... <laughs> If, you're, if someone is saying to you, we're not sure if there's truly free markets happening, 
okay? Immediately you think, okay, is that person crazy? All right, or is it possible it could be true and what is your process to deal with that? So the only way to hand, have a process to deal with if that's true, or even if it's not true, is price. Because price shows us everything that's going on. Dan gave levels for oil. Kevin gave levels for the dollar weighted index versus commodities or vice versa. Ian talked about bonds and where they are and why we haven't been involved with them for a very long time with except exceptions of slivers. The only way to do this is price, trend, and relative strength. And those are the three pillars of adaptive. And I guess that's where I want to close. So I thank you gentlemen for, for your time. I know we didn't give you enough time this evening. I will just shut up more and let you guys do your thing. I thought you all did a great job. I appreciate it. Thank you. So I always like to wrap up with final thoughts. Again, like I said, we're always going to be using our adaptive system, price, trend, relative strength, and we're going to have three main objectives, big wins, small wins, small losses, whether it's a conspiracy or not, whether the fundamentals are great or not, whether the politicians are great or not. The reason why we use adaptive is price knows everything. Okay, so we thank you for your time. Uh, I've got the questions with me. Thank you for those. Paul's going to wrap up. These guys are going to scoot out of here so we can make sure we do uh, good work for our clients. Thank you again. Okay. Another round of applause, please, for, for everyone, for Dan, for Kevin, for Ian, oh, for Dave. And yeah, tons of data. You have it right in front of you. Podcast is another one. Uh, these guys are on it. They're going to head out right now because it is past 1 o'clock. We're going to get you guys out as well. Uh, so appreciate everyone doing that. If you have uh, any needs or problems or challenges you'd like our help with, just schedule a no-fee initial consultation. Just get a hold of our office. You do have a feedback form. We just cranked out a lot of data. We would like to hear back from you. So please fill out that form. Or if you want to scan the QR code, you're welcome to do that. And then hand that in. So Sarah and uh, the team are available there where you checked in. And then finally, next month, we're gonna have our insurance team talking about, whoa, there's a lot, of, speaking of tumultuous, lots going on with insurance rates. They're gonna give some top tips on how to navigate uh, everything going on in the insurance industry now, which hasn't really happened in over a decade. So we're gonna be up next month. That's gonna be Nancy Pick, Steve, and Carrie Seiler. So with that, we are going to adjourn. If you want more food, have at it, our drinks, and then we love seeing you. Enjoy the rest of your week. Take care.